Michael Fernie, it's been an interesting weekend um, of watching GA phone because an awful lot of counties have launched their streaming services and to some degree it's been hit and miss or to some degree there's been teething problems as well because you know this is county boards and the companies that they're getting involved to do it for them it's very much a suck it and see approach and get a few things wrong before eventually ironing it out but do you know what I thought it's great to have access to so many club games all around the country it's unbelievable isn't it really yeah like who would like I was watching bits and pieces of, from Roscommon yesterday and uh, Roscommon football and watching a bit of Limerick hurling as well you pick up it's amazing to think that you know you used to be if you're trying to find out a result you're trying to find out scores that you'd be going to Twitter to get updates and while there's an excitement to it it's fairly painful particularly if you have a team in an accumulator or something like that and you're waiting to see you're waiting to see when it's updated and you don't really know how the game is going you have no real kind of uh, you have no real feel for it but now um, if you have if you have the cash, uh, you can basically watch a game anywhere. I know you watched a couple of different streams uh, over the weekend. How did you find the quality of it? I know it's not going to be perfect, but in general, was it was it a fairly positive experience? Do you know what it was overall? Um, I would say like I watched an awful lot of the Tipperary ones. Um, obviously enough being from Tipperary, and the first game that I watched was definitely teething problems. There, it's probably. If, the, if they were all being streamed from Thurlis, that's a place that's been used a lot, you know, that the broadband is installed, it's all set up for it, but the first game came from Holy Cross and the first half, there was definitely teething problems with the sound and that, but as it went on, absolutely fine, and then the, the games that I watched that came from Thurlis and Nina, they were actually very good, so I think it's a case of onwards and upwards, and you'd expect those sort of teething problems. But um, one game that was actually on TG Cahar uh, the other night, Kilmallock and Napiershig, Kilmallock 216, Napiershig 117. Bit of a surprise win for Tony Considine's men because, you know, Napiershig have been so good over the last number of years. But uh, what stood out to me was Kieran Birmingham, the manager of Napiershig, was asked after the game, was it a problem whereby Kilmallock had more hunger? And he kind of said, I wouldn't necessarily say that. And then Shane Dowling, who of course can't play at the moment, he was asked and he basically said hunger was the issue. So he's, he's been fairly forthright about it. I don't think a manager can say his players aren't hungry enough, but sometimes a player who's, I know he's injured, but on the same level as the other lads, he can more call it out a little bit more, especially someone who'd be held in such esteem. Yeah, strange, strange that there wouldn't be hunger, though, in, in, a, in a way, given the layoff that we've had. You'd imagine lads would be absolutely hopping off the ground, particularly with Napiershig, Napiershig beaten last year as well. You'd imagine that there'd be a fair degree of hunger there, and beaten by Kilbanek, obviously, last year, I think, as well, weren't they? Um, you'd imagine that there'd be a fair degree of hunger there, but it's just amazing, yeah, when you when you get two people maybe talking that are operating off different, off different scripts, um, you can get kind of the political line maybe off one, and then maybe what you'd see to be more the honest line off another and in fairness Shane Dowling he'd always, uh, he'd always call it as it is anyway he could definitely say that about yeah no doubt uh, Adrian Breen scored a great goal for Napiershik in the first half and looked pretty much on fire but as the game went on Kilmallock kind of got the squeeze on them and won four from Graham Mulcahy like it was an exceptional performance he was kind of out around centre forward and we've seen Paddy O'Loughlin play wing back for Limerick but he was more in the half forward line as well to give him that extra physical presence. Um, Oshin O'Reilly actually got a crucial goal. I think it was Mulcahy actually tried a long range score or he was delivering it in. And you could see that the hurley slipped out of one of his hands and it came up a little bit short. Oshin O'Reilly fetched a great ball and uh, slammed it into the roof of the net. So that was a great win for Kilmallock, who I think have had plenty of pain against Napiershig over the years. Um, the only thing is, a team like it, it is early days and Napiershig can come back in the championship. Patrick's well kind of let out a warning shot with a 323 to 26 point win over Adair, a couple of goals from Aaron Galan, but they came from six from behind to win, so it wouldn't be exactly a perfect performance. And what stood out at the other end was Declan Hannon, county centre back, went centre forward for Adair and uh, he scored four points. So Patrick's well won't be too far out of it. No, definitely not. They've been obviously they won last year and won a couple of years before that as well. But just you mentioned about the piercing, if you're going if you're going to get beaten or you're going to have egg in their face, at least they have it on now. They're not knocked out of the championship. They have a chance to come back through the back door. They're obviously 
obviously can't really afford to lose from this stage, but at least it's probably the probably the right time to get beaten in fairness because it's a fair wake up call, particularly if, you know, one of your senior players who's out injured is talking about maybe a lack of hunger, maybe that would uh, it would suggest that there's gonna to have to be a, be a bit of a maybe a state of the nation meeting there as well. But just even we talked about the water breaks last week and I know you bought a tweet there the other night. It's just such they just absolutely rip the scripts up in game. It looked like the Pearcy had started they had started unbelievably well and were well up early on. You get water break, it's amazing what a minute can do, can just slow things down, can give the other the other team, particularly the team that's struggling, a chance just to make a little alteration, maybe change a matchup, maybe get a staff from stand or something, see something that maybe they're not able to see. And then Kilmanic all of a sudden were back in the game by half time when it looked like the Pearcy could have kicked on and they are going to cause havoc over the next while without without a doubt. It's just just upsets the natural flow of the game and we've seen an awful lot now that games have just swung after the 15 minutes in both half. Bo- half. So it's which team deals best with that and uh, I definitely think some teams are struggling with it at the moment. Without doubt because Kilmalik turned it around after that water break and what stood out for me when I was watching that game on TV is that it's supposed to be a minute, but it was actually two minutes, 20 seconds. And, you know, how long does it take to have a little drop of water? We're talking seconds here. And yet you have managers holding court and kind of setting up their defences and reshaping the whole team. And this is something we'll come to again. We talk about the Killer One Sarsfield, uh, Turner Sarsfield's match in Tipperary. But I definitely think it's been abused or else, do you know what, referees aren't kind of uh, marshalling it enough. And it needs to be within that 60 seconds. I think it needs to be 20 seconds, 30 seconds, because... It's ruining the flow of games. It's completely interrupting it. Uh, I've played a couple of games with it now at this stage, and you're actually just going, oh, when the water break comes, because you're like, you know, you want to keep the game going, get into a flow. But just to touch on those final... Just, just on that, Shane, as well, yeah. I'd, probably say, I'd probably say that they shouldn't be let to the... They probably shouldn't be let to the sideline at all. Like, the backs should probably have to go into the goal and get their drink, and maybe the forwards have to do the same down the other end. No more than... you know, Remember in, in recent years in tennis, they, they change it that after one game, remember they used to have always have a break after one game, they'd be allowed to sit down and they changed that rule. But so, and you're supposed to just go and, you know, basically walk around and go to the other side after one game. Some players will sit down or get a drink or whatever. People will always manipulate and manipulate it to their advantage. But I definitely think it, it needs to be strongly released. There's no way that should be more than one minute. Should we not be what more than one minute from the minute the whistle is blown to stop to the police have been blown to restart play. That's 10 or 15 seconds to get to wherever you need to get a drink, 10 or 15 seconds to get back into position and then you're good to go. Mm. So Mona Lean beat South Liberties 116 to 12 points and Bally Brown had a 418 to 214 win over Black Rock. This is Black Rock's return to the top grade after 23 years away. Right, you actually wanted to make a point about uh, teams trading tapes, you know, footage on each other, which is kind of interesting now that the streams are opened up, there's more access than ever in certain clubs because they want their parishioners who can't get into the, these games, they actually want their members to be able to watch them online. So you actually ha- kind of openly have te- having teams uh, expose an opposition to, to footage of each other. Yeah, just even like nearly every game, Bar play or every game, Kuda play or every every game that most senior teams are play, their videos uh, so that they can analyze them themselves. And you know, just say if we play, just say if we play Lockmore Castellani in the morning, uh, that tape might be shared with Lockmore Castellani so that they can have it. Maybe it saves two people having the video of the game. But if just say if we're playing Saint Rhinus next week and someone from Saint Rhinus contacts lock more for the video of the game then it gets very very messy where the opposition have you know your video footage that you're analyzing um at the you know at the audio to give as much detail to your team but they can actually analyze as well and like the team that you're playing and i know for a fact that this is going on definitely between some clubs it's not um you know if we play someone in a practice game that's supposed it's supposed to be technically behind closed doors or whatever but there's definitely uh have been a few tapes and there's definitely been clubs looking for tapes and some clubs have got tapes that they shouldn't have got their hands on as well uh part of me appreciates uh the underhandedness of it as well but suppose when you're playing it when you're playing a practice game or one of the team videos and gives it to the other team it should really be left at that but it's like you know an eagle tape trade remember that great ad that used to be um 
before to make sure you weren't pirating videos or anything like that. But also this kind of illegal kind of convert under the hand type of thing. But it just shows you that GA teams would literally do anything that they have to do to get any sort of advantage or think they have an advantage of the other team. You remind me of when I was a young lad and um, this was back in the day when it was all video cassettes. Now some of the younger viewers probably don't even remember video cassettes. But uh, I remember this lad pulling up to our house, back of his car, you opened up the boot and there was just nothing but tapes there. And there were obviously all pirate tapes. This is back in the back in the glory days. Now, we wouldn't have gone near buying any of these tapes, but I'm just saying that the whole thing existed, where it's all probably on your phones now or, or on your internet or YouTube like this is. But uh, yeah, it is interesting. And you also- You can just see lads, you can just see lads like, you know, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm after getting my hands on, you know, the, the bird video or whatever. <laughs> he's, out banner, he's, out, he's out in Banner or he's out wherever with tapes and DVDs trying, trying to fly them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's such a small world of GEA too. So the manager of one of one team probably knows an, another manager up the road or there's only one or two degrees of separation. So you can see how these tapes would fly around. It's a, a bit like kind of... Let's say I could tap you up for, you know, let's say my team was playing, um, like you said there, Rhinos. I'd tap you up for information about Rhinos. It's kind of like that kind of moving on to another level. Next, le- next level stuff though, isn't it? Yeah, next it is. Next level, everything is moving to a different level at mm. that. Right, so there was loads of county championships on over the weekend. We'll move on to Tipperary, and as I said, I kept quite an eye on this. I paid for the, the 80 euro season pass. I said I'd be watching a few of them, so rather than paying a tenner for a, a one game or 20 quid for the weekend, I said I went all in and uh, paid 80 quid just so I can get every game. It's a great, great deal, in fairness. It is a very good deal. But I've been smart. When you have that, like you're far more likely to watch games rather than, oh, will I pay a tenner for this or will I pay a tenner for that? You can basically watch as much as you want now over the next while, and I guarantee you, you probably end up watching a couple of hundred euros worth of, of footage if you were to put if you were to put an individual match that you'd watch. You mm. know, you'd be fairly bankrupt if you were trying to watch every county championship. I t- I'll tell you that for sure. But uh, yeah. ju- I'll just start off in in Group One in Tipperary. I'll just kind of run through the groups a little bit, and maybe we'll just pick out a few then. Drum and Inch had a 218 to 216 win over Ross Gray. Kiladang in 120, JK Brackens 314. So that was a draw. I watched that game. So that was a good performance from the Temple Moor men. Group 2, Clonoti Ross Moor 218, Aerog, Anna Carty Donahill 16 points. Nina Aerog 119, Holy Cross Bally Cahill 19. Lockmore Castellani 122, My Carkey Burris 17. Thurla Sarsfields 119, Killer Wan McDonough's 113. Group 4, Tumivara and Burris Lee drew 118 to 21 points. And Upper Church Drumban beat Burgess by 21 points to 16. So, um, just to. Well, anything stand out in particular for you before I get going on this? Uh, yeah, probably the Killer Wan Thurla's game because it was. You know, it, it's, two t- it's two things that if. You know, if high profile things from outside of Tipperary were looking for practice games, these would be two that they definitely go on to because you know what you're going to get. And we talked about Turles last week and you know the possible half back then and two matters and Nicky Cattle and then being stung over, you know, uh, been knocked out early the last couple of years. That coming up against well the youth of Killer Man and the potential of Killer Man and it was just um Killer Man were in control for for long for long spells, just anecdotally from from what I've heard from different people that were <laughs> at the game and uh and just, well, watched the stream and all that. But Maybe it's, it's a similar kind of thing at the end. They just weren't able to finish it out. No more than the day a couple of years ago when Ronald Matter came up and got that goal to kill them off in the quarter final at the end. They just didn't finish strongly at all. And Turles had that bit of mouse and a bit of experience coming down the whole stretch. A uh, fairly high quality game, but I think I'm just wondering will that hurt Killer One going forward? Like, will it, will it hurt them for the rest of this year and even for future years? Just that they haven't been able to get the job done uh, in those really, really big games when it really matters. Yeah, because you have this window of opportunity to to establish yourself, and I just, like yourself, I do wonder. You see, as the game went on, and and like the water break was huge, because Sars won 1-8 to a point after that. I mean, they completely steamrolled Killer One down the stretch. And the fact that they had men that they could lump the ball up to, like Dennis Maher, Billy McCarthy, who made his return after that horror knee injury, got a couple of points, and he was involved as the game went on, certainly. Like, Keno Kelly had scored this unbelievable kind of dashing run and finish um, early on for for Killer One. And you thought, right, they're in a the right spot here. They were three or four points ahead in the second half and just completely faded out. Larry Corbett came on, a couple of balls didn't go his way, then fired over a lovely score and had a couple of those touches. You know when he, 
a ball would kind of break in front of him and he'd kind of touch it up um, to himself straight into the hand at full flow. So there's still those flashes, even though I think he's 39 now. But very good. Can I just say that's on, like that's unreal, really too as well to be able to still perform at that level. He turned thirty nine in March, and he's still flying around. At that. Obviously, maybe not as integral as he would have been in other years, but just still wanting to be on the scene, wanting to you know contribute something if he can, and he still has that little bit, that bit of class. Like it's hard to beat that. And fair play to him and other lads like that that keep going. Like he. If he if he's there going next year, he'd be forty hurling next year. And considering the hamstring trouble he's had, I'd say a lot of people would have thought he would have been once he finished up with Tip, he would have been gone out the door fairly quickly. But he's still contributing something for Tardis. And I suppose the idea of maybe getting one more is probably what's keeping it what's keeping the likes of him going as well, especially during lockdown and that the idea of can I contribute something to get Tardis back on the porch again. Mm, absolutely. And like as I said, there's there was target men up front for Tardis when things were getting rough and ready towards the end of the game and, and you needed someone to win a ball whereas at the other end Killer One Buggy O'Mara doesn't seem to be playing this year and like Niall O'Mara won plenty of ball but he can't do it all on his own Jerome Cahill probably would have hoped to have had a bit more of an impact on the game but um, so it's going to be tough for Killer One to get out of this group now because both Lock Moore and Saris have points on the board uh, quick look at the Killadangan against Bracken's game Killadangan were quite unimpressive you know Bracken's are only coming up this year um, Alan Flynn with five points from the half back line will give you an indication of where the scores were coming from for Killadangan. But um, yeah, Lyndon Fairbrother was quite good. Uh, Andrew Orman quite good for J.K. Brackens as well. So that that's a good little impact. You, you you think that Holy Cross kind of struggled coming up and Nina beat them by double scores, one nineteen to eleven points. So I'd be quite impressed with with Brackens. Big result because Kildare to be in the you know the upper bracket usually you think of definitely in Tip Ferry and one of the ones that the outside of tournaments are Boris that are that are the most likely to win it. So yeah, go on. massive result for Brackens. Considering there's usually a fair discrepancy between teams coming up and teams that are you know seasoned senior teams. I would have thought Kildare nearly would have been winning that. Honestly, I would have thought they would have been winning by by probably ten points minimum. And they, they only got a late free to to kind of salvage salvage yeah. the game, you know. Yeah, and oh yeah, and the same when you're talking about late freeze then as well, obviously the tomb the t- tomb getting a draw against Boris Lee, they would have been absolutely delighted at that because as we talked about in the preview show last week, um, while it would have been great to have be following the Tipperary team um, all the way to Crow Park in, in uh, last January or whatever, I'm sure Tomb wanted to kinda kinda keep the upper hand on Boris, which they've had over the the last good while, but it was a big result for them to get a draw and it kinda leaves it leaves them both in with, with uh, obviously Boris have a standing chance to get out of the group, but these two men a life chance as well. Whereas uh, you know, a one point defeat would have been maybe hard to pick it up, but now they're kind of maybe a bit of a spring in their step, particularly with the nature of the, the draw that they got. Yeah, Boris Lee were in control of that game against uh, Toomey Vara. But again, in around that time of the water break, Toom turned it around, Mark McCarthy got a goal that was important. But Boris had hit about six wides in a row, and you know, you only have your yourself to kind of blame in those situations. Sean McCormick was playing full back because my brother Paddy was uh, out injured, Paddy Selton, and uh, he came up the field. Now, I'm sure there was switching around the positions, you know, this kind of thing is uh, hurling as a fluid game. And Sean McCormick would have had, I think, three wides from long distance at different spells. And obviously, you need to be feeding your inside forwards, especially if the likes of Kevin Maher and, um, and J.D. Devaney are so dangerous, and Jerry Kelly as well. And I thought it was interesting, you know, Jerry Kelly's father's Dennis is from Tumi Vara, and there he is. You know, watching his club, but his son playing against him, and he was even doing the, the halftime analysis on Tip FM or on the stream anyway, at, at the very least. So that was quite interesting to see. But a late free from Joey Malachny, who was very good all game, kind of salvaged um, a result for Tumi Vara, which to be fair, they probably deserved. Yeah, and even just in the other game there, we played we had played Upper Church to a man in, in a couple of practice matches. We played with a group over the last couple of years, and uh, I was kind of I wasn't surprised was to see them. Uh, finishing strong enough to beat Purges, beat them by five points. But all in all, just in the other game as well, Travis, we played Ross Gray around the year and I was impressed enough with them too. And they ran, they ran drums very, very close. I think, I think Seamus Callan had a, a bit of a miss here free from out the pitch that, that ended up ended up in the back of the net. And they were kind of chasing the game. So it was a good result for Drum because the more than anything else, if, you're, if you get off to a poor start here, you're really kind of chasing your tail and the negativity can easily set in. So most of I'd say, 
most of what we thought was going to happen happened maybe we t- probably thought Boris would win by a couple of points probably thought Kilarang would win and the, uh, the Turles and Kilarang game was kind of 50-50 up in the air but be interesting to see as I said earlier how will Kilarang kind of bounce back from this will they take the wind out of their sails or will they you know, pick it back up again mm, Absolutely and just a quick note Jake Morris he top scored for Nina and their win over Holy Cross at 9 points as well and a couple of those would have been place balls the Carlo Championship Ballon Killen 119 Bagnastown Gales 14 points and St Mullins had a handy enough win over Nave Owen, 217 to 111. Now jumping on to the Clare Championship, so uh, I believe this one was on uh, the radio down in Clare, and Ballier 16 points, Crochine 14 points, low enough scoring, which is probably not a surprise given how we previewed it last week, that Crochine tend to find a way to sort of look to lock teams down. Apparently Tony Kelly got some, it was referred to as some mental scores, is what I was told. Seven from play, uh, one from his own half, I think, on the sideline um, against the wind. And Davy Fitz, who was involved with his own six mile bridge, apparently he was doing co commentary. And uh, when he knocked it over the bar from distance against the wind, just goes, That's Tony for you. So, I mean, but that, that's no surprise because Tony Kelly's going to be doing that for plenty more years in, down in Clare. Has there been, has there been like, throughout the course of his career, which is a relatively short one, really, particularly his club career, has he struggled to find a better club, a better club or, or a better player that delivers, you know, to such high levels for his club consistently? Like, uh, the only bad game I've ever seen him playing was the All Ireland Club final, funny enough, against yourselves. But I've seen some, as you've described it as mental, I've seen some absolutely mental performances. You know, both, both Egan had videos of, I think I think got a stupid amount from playing in a game last year as well. During the day against Turles, yeah. they went extra time and even just in normal time down. I think it was in Walsh Park in uh, or Cusy Park in Ennis, and he put over some crazy scores the same day as well. And even yesterday, he just seems to be. He always seems to deliver despite the, for for Ballier, despite the fact that he's obviously getting added attention. Like if you're crushing, what what's your, your one of your main parts of your game plan? Squeezing out Tony Kelly and trying to keep him out of the game. And yet he still just manages to deliver these tour de force performances at club level. It's it's unbelievable really. Yeah, sure like in twenty seventeen in that All Ireland Club final we had two lads alternating on him you take five minutes on him or well ten minutes on him and you take ten minutes on him. So that's the sort of attention mm. he gets that no other player would. Uh, and you know, like so many of his scores are off his left hand side. Now I'm not saying he's one sided, but have you ever seen a, a player so good? Who's the best one sided player ever? Like, can we even call him a little bit one sided? Oh Lord, you'll have a few, but you'll have a few people on you there over yeah. that. I'd say. But, um, I don't mean it in scores. the truest sense of the word, but he is fairly heavily dominant on his left side. Yeah, and he's he's brilliant at uh, he's brilliant at that fake on the right, back to the left. He's he's so he's so good at doing that. He does the little tap on the horn, goes back on to the left. Other other thing, one side of players, Jenny Mack, um, Graham Mulcahy. Good Graham Mulcahy. I was just going to make the point on lads that are pre- are predominantly left sided. You are usually kind of more one sided, we'll say, than you know the lad that's just the orthodox, we'll just say a Patrick Horgan, who's right or left and can alternate between both, no problem. But his right would be a strong side. Whereas lads that usually take, even like Tony Kelly would take threes off his left, Graham McCann be left sided as well. They're usually far more stronger on that side. It's kind of like a left footed left foot top player, left foot, foot Gaelic football player. You're looking at someone like, you know, let's say Georgie Hadji in soccer or Kieran McDonald in Gaelic football, you, you, t- you tend to think of them as being left footed, not being, you know, being pre- really predominantly one sided. And I think the hurling is kind of the same when you're predominantly left sided, kind of your right side, you just you just don't seem to use it as much. He definitely, Tony Kelly would only use his right side, um, I'd say one in four, maybe one in five times. That, particularly if he's striving any sort of a long ball in or going for a score, it's predominantly off the left. And can you think of any other left sided players? That are really kind of well, not necessarily left sided, but very it's very few that are right sided and right sided alone. If you know what I mean. Yeah, actually, just when thinking of it, there it just reminds me of a of a little bit of a joke that I have with a similar player that plays with us in Cool and Nicky Kenny. If he's got a few scores, we'd say, "Jiz, you were hitting him over today, off left and left." Whereas normally it's a, a lad that's supposed <laughs> to hit him over off left and right. 
But uh, look, if, if anyone has any suggestions on that, anyone who they think is very dominant towards one side or the other, let us know, and who is the best at it too. So just to run through a couple of more of those scores in the round one in Clare. So Cratlow 315, Kimeli 211, O'Callaghan Mills 213, Broadford 17, Fecal 21, Whitegate 16, Clonlara 19, New Market and Fergus 114, and Ina, Ina Kilnamona 217, Clooney Quinn without Peter Duggan, so I guess he isn't uh, available this year. Uh, 14 points. Six Mile Bridge, looking for a fifth title in eight years, beat Aero Guinness 17 points to 12. Uh, one handily enough, as far as I can tell from online. Yeah, they were reduced to 14 men, I think. I think it was either late in the first half or early in the second half, and still kind of with the handbrake on. So, at the same last week, kind of, Tim Crow was the manager, and Davy Fitz, a coach, and Sir Shapulson, um was coach last year, and I'm sure he's on the scene again. He's usually most places, uh, Davy is. So, yeah, they probably they probably look like the favourites, but the likes of, the likes of Ballier, Cracklow, and even uh, Clan Nara, who I've had a few pops at over the years, they're probably the, the main kind of contenders chasing after them. And um, we'll move on to the Galway Championship. I don't know if you saw it, but Sarsfield's 422, Portumna 18 points. Now this game was you couldn't only miss it. Yeah. You couldn't miss it to be honest with you. you. Couldn't miss it if you were on Twitter yesterday. Yeah, there was only three points in it with ten minutes to go. Joe Canning gets sent off, and then Jack Canning gets his marching orders as well. What did you make of that red card for Joe Canning? I mean, I suppose the referee decided that he had interfered with the helmet, but it looked very, very innocuous, and you'd imagine he's going to no. have that rescinded. Yeah. Now he didn't see the whole the whole game, but Joe was on a yellow card already at that stage, was he? Yeah. Yeah, so Joe was going to me. Joe was going to walk anyway. To send a straight red um, for the helmet interference, I thought it was a bit ridiculous because the helmet just seemed to pop off. But for the body slam, I do think he deserved a second yellow. I'm not, I'm not going to lie, um, because he can't just grab a lad and throw, throw him to the ground. Now, what, what he got the actual straight red for um, was a bit ridiculous, and I think it was just a couple of kind of things combined to make it look much worse. Than it was. I'm not really even sure. His hand didn't seem to be up around the helmet, so I'm not even sure how it popped off. I do have sympathy for for the officials, though. Like, what are you supposed to do in in real time when you see a lad kind of body slamming a lad to the ground and the helmet of the other fella is off, and you're kind of thinking, well, he obviously must have interfered, and his hand was up around there, so he must have interfered with. It. So I do have some sympathy for it, uh, particularly at club level. The standard of officials is obviously not as good as it would be at county level, but I'd imagine the red would be rescinded. It would have to be. But I probably think he was probably going to be red carded anyway because it was definitely a foul off the ball anyway. Mm. What I'm wondering is, you know, and I watched it a couple of times and I'm trying to decide were his, were his fingers somehow holding on to the face guard and that was the reason that it popped up off? I don't think so. It didn't look that way because he was holding his hurley. And I wondered if maybe the heel of the hurley caught on to, you know the way there's the clasp that goes up around the side of the... Yeah. the and I wondered, did it kind of catch that and then just send it popping? I don't know. Either way, I didn't think there's no straight red in that as far as I'm concerned. And that's just... did, did you have any worry? I thought we were going to see another Paul Galvin moment immediately after it happened. They honestly did. <clears> um... I just, I just thought he was kind of going to make a beeline. It looked like he was going to make a beeline for the, for the line zone, which would be totally our character yeah. for Joe and Ferris. But I just, when I was watching it, I was like, I kind of had my hand in my head. I was like, oh, no, I thought he was going to go over there or whatever. And the nature of the game has been streamed and the fact that there's nobody there, you could hear all the verbals and everything he said towards the line zone as well. Yeah, well, the thing that, um, luckily, like he's so far away from the linesman that you as a player, you have a long time to sort of consider your actions before you get there. Whereas if you're in Galvin's situation and you're right beside the referee as he produces mm. the card that you're not expecting then that's more of a, an impulse reaction so luckily not much more happened but like the game obviously completely turned and for Sarsfields who won a, a title a few years ago and were beaten in the All-Ireland semi-final by Cushendall it's a nice little boost for them and Connor Cooney he, he scored a goal there at one point now it trickled over the line but just he did some pickup just to get through and, uh, and get himself in on goal Joseph Cooney, yeah, sure. They'd be Sorry, delighted Joseph to have him Cooney, back, yeah. sure. They'd be absolutely delighted to have him back. He'd be would have been their mainstay. He was uh, he was centre back when they when they won the club title a couple of years ago and they don't serve far along too big he's, he's better as a back than he is as a forward. Um but yeah, no, it's a, it's a good win for them. I mean, it, there was a picture of of Jack Canning and Joe Canning walking off the pitch together. Like it's amazing how quickly a game can turn. We talked about water breaks, but like even when there's a sending off like that 
and it can just totally deflate you then all of a sudden uh, Jack Canning his, his nephew was on the line as well and they're both sent off together um, I'd say Portumna who barely kind of saved her bacon last year would have kind of maybe fe- fears now that the that the season could unravel but hopefully hopefully George should be back I, I wouldn't see any reason why he wouldn't be back I think he did think he deserved to be sent off but definitely not uh, a straight red and for the nature of what he's supposed to have done or what he was implicated for doing mm. So just to run through some of the other round one results Capitagal at 4.15 Tina Abbey Denairy 2.15 Ormore Marie 117, Claren Bridge 19 points, so that's a win for Ormore Marie, who were, of course, not long up, Grode McInerney and Niall Burke uh, sort of buttressing that team. Tommy Larkins 116, Loch Ray 15 points, Turlock Moore 117, Liam Mellows 115, so that's a good win, and St Thomas's had a narrow win over Castlegar 223 to 318. Anything stand out for you there? Yeah, no, just a, a big, big comeback win for Thomas, in fairness, we talked about, uh, we talked about the fact that Thomas will probably have aspirations of you know winning a club on Ireland, which obviously is not going to be possible this season. We wondered what their hunger will be like, but they, they showed a fair appetite for Bathley yesterday because they were they were well down. Castlegar were well on top of Ferris. Sort of more made it made a bit of a statement. Mellows have been beaten in the last two finals, and um, were, were county champions the year before that as well. So that's a fair statement of intent, and I believe Dottie Work was wearing eight and, and hovered around that kind of middle third as well. So sort of more of an awful lot of English success and are are they kind of like Killer One in Tipperary? They're they're going to be there thereabouts and. You know, they need to probably kick on in the next year or two, but they're probably the standout result. Yeah, yeah, you can only be kind of hovering around for so long. You need to, you need to make that uh, breakthrough. Waterford Championship. So Austin Gleeson was the main ma- man for Mount Zion as they beat Clane one nineteen to one thirteen. He scored eight points, three from play, three sideline cuts, and two placed balls. So obviously, this kind of this body revamp is having some sort of an impact if he's. Um, if he's if he's making the impact that he that he was in that game, um, so I was just reading in the Watford um, on the Watford newspaper that basically he was flying it. So that's great to hear. Ah, uh, great to hear. Yeah, sure. I think everybody wants to uh, everybody wants to see him back at that kind of twenty sixteen type of form, that harder the year type form. So yeah, the only thing I'd say now is like they would have been well expected to be Clanny. They would have been well expected. So it'd be interesting when they when they have kind of maybe higher profile op- opposition just to see how he gets on against them. I think his brother, I think it's a chain, his brother as well, I think played quite well yesterday too. But it was just interesting when they come up against the likes of De La Salle and Bally Gunner and these and even four mile water just to see how they get on. But yeah, great to see great to see him back at that type of level and hopefully he can maintain that because when the county championship starts it'll be a lot more interesting if you have a fly in Austin Lee. Mm. And Stephen Roach, he scored a late goal and a point to kind of guaranteed a win there because it wasn't certain heading into the final stages you mentioned four mile water there they had a 21 point to 117 win over Dun Garvin Jamie Barron with six from play and his his brother Tom who we've seen with Watford this season already bigger sort of a frame than Jamie uh, he also apparently impressed De La Salle they had a 222 to 112 win o- over Bally Saggart Jack Fagan he scored 113 Stephen Bennett top scored for Bally Saggart you know small club with one eight, and then um, Bally Gunner, a very very heavy win over Tallow, two twenty two to nine points, and a couple of goals for Desi Hutchinson, who we're obviously always keeping a close eye on here because I just think uh, the potential for inter county and and what he could do there is huge. I think it's interesting just when you go down through it all, like who who are the main players that stood out? You know, Austin Gleeson, Jamie Barron, Jack Fagan, Stephen Bennett, Desi Hutchinson. They're all lads. Particularly, most of them are, are in attack as well. That Watford will want to see flying later on in the year. So I think it's it's important that those players are really really excelling for their club. And I'd say Liam Cattle is probably a happy man. He knows what he's going to get mostly in defence. He has a fair idea what he's going to get anyway. It's an attack that's really been the problem. They haven't been able to put big scores in the last couple of years. So I think he'd be a happy enough man, um, whether he was at games at the weekend or whether he's looking at videos and things. I think he'd be happy enough for what he saw. Mm. And De La Salle, they had a gazebo set up for the players to get changed in, and, and I presume they, they had a little bit of their supplies for the game there as well. What have you. What have you experienced in terms of uh, you know replacing a dressing room or even keeping your gear safe during games? Yeah, we 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 were standing bar, so like we'd be leaving our gear in the stand or our gear in the dugout or whatever. But 
like we've we championship on Friday night, so that's going to be a little different. Um, I'm not too sure exactly what we're going to do with the Dallas Stars team with the with the gazebo with interest. Their sponsors um, are a car company down in Waterford who would have different gazebos and things for like maybe like portable showrooms and maybe for you know the Valentine's championships or something like that. So they they brought a big like, kind of a gazebo with them just to keep them dry and somewhere to put their gear. I think they didn't have access to a stand or anything the other night, and it's a good idea. Um, and somewhere you can go back to I suppose a half time rather than the corner of the pitch, and um, it's a bit more of a kind of a sanctuary or something. Somewhere you can kind of go to and somewhere you can kind of replicate the, the dressing room kind of environment even, even if it's just for a couple of minutes beforehand and a couple of minutes after. But uh, it's definitely a re- very, very unusual environment for a championship game. Um, I heard Michael Quinlan saying there during the week about, you know, the last time they left the gear bags on the side of the pitch was for an under-10 blitz and that's kind of what it's like now. It, it feels kind of kind of strange and it's going to be interesting to see over the next while just uh, what different clubs are doing just to, I suppose, create some sort of a a, play, a kind of a place or a kind of a safe haven where they can give instructions and where lads can kind of get togged off and it's not suppose you can talk through tactics or whatever what sort of things have you gone through anything like that or have you had anything in place I had a few funny things yeah so with the a senior B match that I played there recently we have so everyone kind of have leave your gear uh, down in Shankill there's two pitches side by side it's kind of a it's public park and uh, so we're all leaving our gear kind of spread out and you're leaving your water kind of beside your bag but there's also a tent <laughs> someone has a small little like two-man tent there and you can throw stuff inside that you know just people throw their gear bags there in case it starts raining heavily so it's actually tent a tent set up on the side of the field which is kind of gas and uh, actually that was for the senior B match against St Finbar's and actually the physio came over and said oh I'm looking for Finbar and uh, our manager's name is Finbar Murphy but we were playing against St. Finbar's. And she goes, oh, I'm looking for Finbar's. And he goes, oh, I'm Finbar. So she actually started doing physio on me, even though she was supposed to be <laughs> with the other team oh, before gosh, the game. She went, she eventually went back over to the other side then when we all realized it. And then we played a challenge match the other night with the senior A team. And what we did is just got dressed and then uh, just threw all my gear back into the car. And some people would have had tops or whatever, and they were just put into a huge sort of industrial plastic bag car keys given to a guy and that was kind of you know you just kind of make do so that's what we kind of do for the meantime um just moving on to the last couple of results that i have here and of course if we've missed anything please message us in or any points from the weekend we're talking about let us know on twitter so the westmead championship round one Clonkill 117 raharney nine points castletown gagan 115 lock lane gales 19 and then in wexford and i'll definitely talk about fade harriers later in the week when we're doing a preview haven't had first-hand experience of them, but uh, Fern St. Aidan's uh, 21, St. Moog's of Feather 115, St. Anne's 217, Glen Barntown 119, Navena, county champions from a couple of years ago, beat Rapparees, who were without Liam Ryan, uh, 211 to 16 points, so just by a point there, so the loss of Liam Ryan is, is huge there, and St. Martin's had an eight-point win over Clock Bawn, 23 points to 15. Yeah, no, foreign, the foreigners are a team. I, we would have played a good few times down through the years. They were playing a, it was tight the whole day between them and, and Moe to Feather, but they finished with a flourish to win. And even St. Anne's as well, like Dylan O'Keefe and Dylan O'Keefe and Lee Moe were were brilliant again. Like, and they're, like, they're not, you know, they're not, they don't have, wouldn't have that, you know, a massive pick in that, but they seem to be really maximising what they, what they do have in, in recent years. Obviously, beating the county final last year. Um, uh, yeah, and maybe England as well. And you look at that result, you think the 2 11 to 16, and you think, Jesus, Lee Ryan surely would have been able to keep some sort of wraps on, on Colin McDonald or Colin Dunbar, and he surely would have been a two or three point swing. But because he, he got injured, be it with Club or County or wherever it was, um, he's basically missing the whole club championship, and they're really, really suffering as a result. Great stuff, Michael. That's it for Club Talk Hurling. As I said, if we missed anything, please let us know on social media and follow Michael there at, at ML Verney at Shane Saint for myself and um, there'll also be a football club talk coming out as well so keep an eye out for that too thanks Michael thanks a million Shane